let's, uh, let's get started. Um, so I have mission two from most of you. Um, and um, I hope the people that aren't here are going to bring me mission two soon because otherwise it is the start of a bad pattern, <laughs> right? There's no more sure way to do bad in a math class than to just kind of skip the homework, right? It's uh, really where you learn the most from is doing that homework for yourself, right? So um, I've posted the solution to mission two and also mission one in course content, right? So we're section eight, right? And uh, here's the required missions and solutions folder in there. You click in there. Of course, you found mission one and two in there already, so you've been there before, right? Um, but now the solution to mission one is posted in there. All right, so here that is. And we can talk about those today, of course. Um, and also, I posted the solution to mission two. So it's also in there. So we. Huh, yeah. Yeah, I just posted it. <laughs> no, I don't usually post solutions to the homework before it's due. I mean, if I do, it might just be a couple minutes. A couple minutes would help. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. Um, so, um, that's the that's the situation. Now, is there any particular um, problem you'd like to look at um, in mission two? Now that uh, now that I have this open and you've just been working on it, and is there a particular one that you were confused about that you'd like to have me walk through? The perpendicular ones. So like perpendicular and parallel, yeah. Let's see here. The one with the area. Yeah, we can look at those. Oh, that's funny. Why did it scan this black and white? Didn't it scan the start color? That's weird. Like I shaded in these boxes over here and like orange and stuff. And the scanner decided to just do a black and white. Isn't that weird? How, so it can it decides page by page what setting to be on. It's okay. That is that's weird. That's weird. The graph. Yeah, it wouldn't pull up for you where. Really? You mean. Come on. Second here. Like, uh. Like this one? This one more? That would work? I mean, that worked, right? And, uh. Let's see here. This one worked, right? See, those worked. I mean, did that, seriously, did that not work for you, like these? Oh. Really? Oh, e email me when that sort of thing happens. I'll, I'll just send you the link directly, you know? Um, it must be like the your Adobe Acrobat viewer must be set up so that it won't open links or something. Because it's kind of like a pop-up from Adobe. And that it may be that your like security setting doesn't allow for it or something, and uh, and and so that deprived you of you know clicking the answer to this one, which is the so that was so I I may have done that. See, so you missed out on that. There you go. You, you, you guys know what Rick rolling is, right? Okay. Yeah, I was, I, I'm kind of curious, right? Because with each generation that passes, like, I think these things are forgotten. But no, the Rick roll is still very much still with us. Your generation is very much aware. So I, I had to check on that. But see, in principle, I had lulled you into a false sense of complacency, having given you legitimate links 
to three previous problems. I waited until I was like four lengths in to do the Rickroll. It just seemed right. Um, yeah, anytime you see like final exam solution on my website or something like that, be suspicious. Be very suspicious. Um, oh, you guys were asking me a question before I got distracted. Um, so the, here's the parallelogram one. So basically, this parallelogram is set up so that the, um, from A to B is horizontal, right? Because it's got the same Y. And um, so you can just figure out the base, 5 minus 2. Oh, 5 minus 1. I'm an idiot. Base is 4. And the height from there to there, right? So like y equals 2 all the way up to y equals 6. So the height's also 4. So area of a parallelogram, base times height, 16. <laughs> Some sort of, yeah, we, you do trigonometry in here, like, that's next semester, right? I'm, hey, if you guys want me to do sine and cosine and angles in here, like, I could do, I mean, I am, I'm a full service math professor, like, I, I can do, I can easily spend, like, three weeks in here on that. Oh. We could do it, we could do it with complex numbers, that would make it easier. No? But any complex number can be written in like. Time, time multiple. You want me to give you a mad minute and <laughs> start at the, start the quiz with a mad minute. <laughs> but I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be. Uh, if I do that, I'm gonna be real draconian. Like I'm gonna give it out. I'm gonna go, turn your papers over, and at, at a minute, I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna stop it. And whatever happens, happens. And there's no calc. There is. There ain't, there ain't no calculators during a mad minute. That's all right. Mad minute, a mad minute is. is <laughs> yeah, two times. Yes. Yeah, two, yeah, two times. Two, two times five, six times seven. That can be part of the quiz. I will make question one on the quiz a mad minute. Why not? It would be fun. Let's see what happens. I'm not, but I'm not grading that though. So we're only going to do that if you'll grade your neighbors. You sure? If it, wait a minute, huh? Yeah. All right. The triangle one is pretty much the same song and dance, except um, these are relatively easy questions because the one of the legs of the triangle or the size of the parallelogram is horizontal. So you can easily calculate the length just using the difference of the uh, x coordinates. If the triangle was like on a tilt or something, this problem would get more complicated, right? Because it would actually take some, some more effort to figure out what actually the length of the base of the triangle was. But here, it's, it's horizontal, so you can figure out the, the base has length 6, because 4 minus, wait a minute, my laser, 4 minus and minus 2 is 6, and then the height well, the height is that distance, which is 1 to 4, which is, I think, 3. Did I do something wrong? Oh, you, you guys did something wrong. Yeah, was it, you weren't saying I. Yeah, I have not, I have not taught the uh, area of parallelogram or the uh, area of a triangle in here, but that. See, this is. This, so this is the fundamental. This is the fundamental problem. <laughs> a fundamental problem math departments have communicating with every other department on a university. You go into history; they've got a 500-level course, and they've got three history courses as prerequisites for that. Why are they there? They're there to keep the audience to a certain set of students. You, me, the janitor—they could go in there. And they could join the conversation about that 500 level history course, right? They just need to read some and to have some time to think about it. I'm not saying it's stupid. I'm just saying that anybody can join that conversation, right? You go to a 500 level math class and it's got X, Y, Z as prerequisites. That's not just to like try to make the audience a particular kind of student. It's, it's because those are things we use, <laughs> you know, the prerequisites in mathematics, they're they're not idle threats. They're working tools 
of the course, right? And that's true at every level of math. And books on Chinese. Ah. Hmm. I had a friend that read, read Chinese for fun, but uh, anyway. <laughs> no, but so the, what I'm trying to say is that there will be times that something's in the homework or the test that I haven't talked about, and that's just because it's like prerequisite, right? Like area of a triangle or area of a parallelogram. Um, that said, I try not to spring that kind of stuff on you on tests. Like I'm fine on a homework where you can look stuff up, right? But hopefully the test doesn't have like, hey, figure, <laughs> figure, figure out the volume of a five-sided pyramid. You know. How many problems are usually in my test? Uh, the answer I always give to that is enough. Enough for me to see whether you know what you know. I mean, we could. I could have. I could have one problem. I could. I mean, I could have one problem with like parts A, B, C, D, E, F. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. You know, like one problem, multiple parts. You can always do that, right? If you have a mastery, a <clears throat> solid understanding of how we did the problems in missions one and two, you should be fine for the quiz and test. The quiz, the, <clears throat> the, yeah, the quiz essentially serves as a sort of pretest. It'll be, the quiz is long enough, it has to be, the quiz, the point of the quiz is to ask you some of the questions you think you know, but with time pressure. Because the, there's always a certain amount of time pressure on the test, you know? This is the nature of math tests. Participation. I will, I will, and I often do say that a test is the ultimate form of class participation, but it is done one student at a time. Or I have to figure out policies of the university to take action and stuff like that. And I just don't want to do that. Like, I, nothing I hate more than pursuing, like, cheating. It's like, it's just, it's just the worst. Can you make it easy you not cheat? Yeah, just make it easy you won't cheat. <laughs> what? Why, why do you guys want less for your money? Like, you paid for a pre-calculus class. Don't you want a pre-calculus class? I mean, the GPA needs to be up. You need to pay. You guys are killing me. All right. Well, not yet. <clears throat> this one? Yeah, I mean, it can be easy. But just because the question is easy doesn't mean you can do it, right? Because you need to understand the words. What do the words mean, right? What does a solution to an equation mean? It means that if you plug the point in, the equation's true, right? You guys got this one? You got it? Well, it, it, is, it is somewhat, this question is really like somewhat disconcerting given like how, how much work some of the other problems were, right? But you know, where I used to work, there's a professor and like, I think in like one of the senior level math classes, he, as one of his questions on a test, he put, let x equal to five. What can you say about x? And they just left it blank. <laughs> no, 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 they left it blank because it was so disconcerting to them to have this question. <laughs> well, now that I told you, it's no fun. So. You, guys, you sure you don't want to cover trigonometry in here, too? It's really interesting. You know. Man. But I miss trigonometry. Um, now, this, yeah, I mean, I, I said to redraw it by hand. I mean, you, this is what happens when you click on there. It, uh, although the, answer, the actual picture is like, it's more, it looks more like a peanut than mine, a little bit more. It's kind of like more 
full. But anyway, the larger point here is the, um, if you look at it, the y-intercepts are 0, 1, and 0, minus 1, and the x-intercepts are actually at 1, and plus or minus 1, and 0. That was my one request, is to label the x and y-intercepts. Um, and uh, this one is funny. Well, I mean, you, the graph wouldn't open for you guys, so I, I will take that into consideration. But you, you skipped it, right? So there you go. But do email me when I have something like that and it doesn't work. My it didn't go through. So you tried to email me and it didn't go to my email. Really? Happened to you too? That is not cool. Like that should not happen. If that happens, my other email. And I hate to do this because I'm really trying to keep. Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm trying to keep like school emails on the UWA email, so please don't use this unless that fails. But if it does, um, I do check this pretty often. I regret this email every time I fill out some application. <laughs> you want me to explain the name? Oh, thank you. So if we have phi, it's a mapping from, say, R4 four, four, to, like, say, lambda. Then let's see, how's it go? G, oh, no. G theta. So this, this is a, a super field. A super field is a function that has super space. This is super space as its domain. And the way it works is like, <clears throat> I'll underline them. These ones, So these ones, uh, and that, and let's see here. Also that, these are all, these are all, um, if I recall correctly, these are all bosons. Whereas <clears throat> this one and this one, these are these are fermions. So basically, um, the superfield, the components of these things, they're each like ordinary fields on space-time. And so what happens is you get a balance between the number of fermionic degrees of freedom and the bosonic degrees of freedom. And so like it's, it's a way to represent what's called supersymmetric physics, which you guys have watched Big Bang Theory. Yeah? You, you, you guys watch Big Bang Theory? You know that stuff Sheldon talks about? It's the kind of math you need to understand that, give or take. Yeah. Is my, my, my thesis is like on this stuff. Right. It's, it's kind of mathematical physics, but but I will put that away. But that's that's why the email because these are this is a classical superfield. You take those things and then you do. Ooh, where do you? I mean, what 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 do you say? How long does it take you to learn that? Like, what part of my education do are we counting? Like after like high school or yeah. like eight or nine years to get to it and then another four to understand it so I'm trying to remember it's a good question Five, seven, I think 11 years total I think so yeah well I'm not like you guys like the last seven of that I got paid like it's only like the first five that you know I had to pay for. 
once you get to once you get to grad school in like math and physics, they pay you to be there. If they don't pay you to be there, they probably don't want you there. They'll still let you come and take your money. But if you don't have support, eh. anyway. Yeah, I, I had I found places that would foolishly give me money. Yes. So, I mean, they do use you as sort of slave labor. They force you to teach classes for, you know, below poverty wages. You know, when you make less than twenty thousand dollars a year or something, or in the neighborhood of twenty thousand dollars a year, and you're asked to live in Long Island, that's a that's a bad place, right? I mean, because like. In Long Island, you can spend six hundred dollars for like an illegal basement apart, legal like garage apartment. Easily, it's like I don't know twelve hundred for like a single, like studio or something stupid like that. What is it around here? You know, you got dorms. You have a studio around here. Do you have a studio apartment around here? No. One bedroom apartment. You don't know. You guys don't. Would you guys camp or something? You live with your parents? Livingston? 500 for like a two bedroom or one bedroom? One bedroom. See, that's, that's reasonable. I like that. I can, but. But yeah, that, that, this, this is my, um, my other email. And so if, if for some reason my school email, like if I don't get back to you within a couple hours, feel free to send something to that. And I'll try to reply to you with my, well, I don't know. Well, I need to figure out, so here's the thing. I'm, when I scan from copiers, printer scanner copiers right now, it will not send scans to my email, my UWA email. There is something wrong with my current account. I don't know exactly how far the tentacles of that reach. Um, so like to scan this, I'm actually like sending that to this email. And it's it's and I'm not I can't do it through my account either. I have to like hack another professor's like login. It's bad. Um, so it's entirely possible that like some of you are sending emails to my UWA from your UWA account and it's not getting through. And if that's happening, I need to know about it because I don't want you to feel like I'm not responding to your emails, you know? Because I do respond to emails pretty fast. And if I don't respond to yours, that means that it's not actually gotten to me. So there is, of course, the other possibility, which is that, like, you've, you know, like, put the wrong email for me down. But that's not likely. Jay Cook is hard to mess up, right? I mean, the thing is, Jay Cook was a previous email of somebody else who's gone. So I think that that's the theory, anyway, some of the other professors have is, like, that's how it's gotten messed up. But anyway, long story short, you can use a super long email. <laughs> so <laughs> my wife gives it to somebody. They're like, does he like classical music? I'm like, no, this is like, this is classical in the sense of physics. In physics, we say physics is classical if it's not quantum mechanical. So like classical physics is up to quantum mechanics. But, yeah. but anyway. Yeah, I, I, I like physics. It's true. I can't deny it. All right. Um, anyway, other, other questions about this? Oh, I mean, it is what it is, but you um, you definitely want to figure out like you know where where you went wrong. Um, but I I will grade pretty generously if you did something and turned it in. Like you probably have not the worst grade possible. If you left everything blank, that'll that'll get you. Um, that said, like I will over the totality of the semester give more homework points than are needed for the grade. So like, I forget offhand how many homework I had in your, in your, um, your course plan. Does anybody remember what percentage your homework was of the total course grade? <laughs> it was 30. <laughs> that is extremely unlikely in a pre-calculus class. <laughs> I mean, when, they, when I was in the interview process here, they said, they said, we have a problem with grade inflation at this university, and we need to hire you to, you know, help work with it. We have trouble with too many high grades. We need somebody to come in and, like, rule with an iron fist. And so that's the mandate I've been given. You know, I have no choice, but I'm joking. I'm, I'm joking. So did you find it? No? 
Ah. I once had a class with a fellow named uh, Dr. Martin, and uh, he was an interesting fellow. He was, he was a farmer and a you know, math professor. Sometimes he talked about his farm. And um, anyway, he, uh, he, a lot of times he'd come in the first day class, and he'd introduce himself as square root Martin. <laughs> Once he introduced himself as cube root Martin, <laughs> and then he'd say, they call me square root Martin because I only passed the square root of the class. <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> it, square, a square root is a number that when you square it, it gives you back, you know, like the square root of 36 is 6 because 6 times 6 is 30. Sorry, I'll stop. You guys know what a square root is. Don't do that to me. I'll not allow that. Let's see here. Um, come on. I usually include the, yeah, so I said the homework is 150 points. But what, what's going to end up happening is I'll probably give like 180 problems or something like that. So if you got all of those right, you'd have 30 points extra. But on the flip side of things, if you miss 10 points right now, you could easily like cover it up with more homeworks later. I think I've given you how many points already for like test one? Wasn't there 30 points in mission one and there was 30 points on mission two? I said there are 30 points during here at the top of mission two. I'm pretty sure I put 30 on both of them, which means I've already given you 60 points, right, to earn. And so we have, so if that continues, then that would mean there's at least like 180 points, maybe a little bit more because we've got this little um, after test three bit two, right? So. There might well be 40 points extra that you could earn from homework if you did it all. That, you know, it's, it's hard to get all of the homeworks right when they're assigned because there's always a certain amount of other things that you have going on, right? It's hard to get all the homework right all the time. Just try to do your best. That's all you can do, you know? And come to me for help when you need it. So. My, my typical tests in a course like this are usually about three or four pages. Um, I don't try to do too much because I can pretty much tell whether or not you understand what's going on with a fairly short test in here, right? What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm not, well, I was just talking to you about that. There's nothing to really see there. I'm going to put this away. Um, You want to turn off the light again if we're going to do that? Let's see here. Step number 13. Oh, mission two, huh? Oh, man. I closed it, didn't I? Dummy. Me, not you. It seems like we've got some time today. Maybe I could go back and cover those word problems we skipped. No, no. Okay. Well, I like to group problems together that have the same idea. That's usually why I have parts in a problem. Um, so what about this one? 13, 13B or... Is that 13 part B? Who, I, I've lost track of who, who said what? Uh, both of them? OK, so, so the basic, um, my laser go. Basic idea here is this is set builder notation, right? So it's pairs x comma y such that this condition holds, right? What does it mean for the absolute value of x to be less than to or equal to 2? That means that minus 2 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2, right? We can unwrap that kind of inequality with this. Uh, I guess this is a compound inequality, right? Um, and so what that means graphically is that you're stuck between x equals 2 and x equals minus 2 in this middle region, this vertical strip. It goes on and on forever and ever. 
I'm very annoyed that it didn't pick up my, this is shaded like bright orange in my solution. I don't know why it didn't, the scanner didn't pick that up. Yeah, between minus two and two, that's the thing is that the, the, I know, right? It's very annoying. So the shading is like this actually. So I'll have to try a different shading. I, I used a colored pencil here and it, it didn't, uh, it didn't pick up on it. So it could be the resolution. I chose a fairly low resolution so the PDFs aren't huge. But yeah, does that, that, does that make sense, this one? Sure. So the next one, again, we're looking at pairs x comma y subject to these two conditions, right? And so I just treat those two separately. First of all, x minus 1 less than or equal to 1 absolute value. That less than or equal to 1 means minus 1 less than or equal to x minus 1 less than or equal to 1. If I add 1 across that, I get 0 less than x less than 2, right? And, and, and this one, again, same idea. And I just solve that inequality and get to minus 6 less than y less than minus 2, which again means that I'm between minus 6 and 2, and I'm between 0 and 2. So that gives me this handy-dandy little rectangle there as the solution set. For what it's worth, you could write that solution set as follows. Um, you could actually write that solution set as 0, 2, Cartesian product with um, minus 6, minus 2, like that is the answer here. But that's not something I've really taught in class. So I, I don't think, I don't see myself testing on taking Cartesian products of intervals. But you can take Cartesian products of intervals to get rectangles in the plane if you want. In fact, the part A, you could also write as the Cartesian product of minus 2 to 2 with the whole reals that, that gives you that vertical strip. Like if you wanted a formula, a cold, hard formula for that set, that would be it. That's equivalent to that picture that was not quite right scanned. <laughs> Other questions? Maybe we should go back to mission one a little bit and talk about those problems, yeah? So let's start at the beginning. It's a very good place to start, right? Um, I also, um, by the way, have a, um, let's see here. So any, any, let me just start with question one. Are there any questions about number one? So th this is a useful principle. When we have absolute value of x minus 2 less than or equal to 1, the way we can think about that is that the distance from x to 2 is at most 1. Like absolute value of one number minus another number, that is the distance between those two numbers on the number line. This is a useful thing to keep in mind. It will help you um, sort of see through inequalities. Of course, we can also, you know, do hand-to-hand -hand combat with it, like down here, unwrap that as minus 1 less than x minus 2 less than 1, and solve, and get x goes between 1 and 3. But I can also look directly at the number line and go, so like the distance between 2 and x is at most 1, right? So I can go one unit that way, I can go one unit that way, and that means I have satisfied the distance between 2 and x is less than or equal to 1. So like if you think about distance in the number line, you could write down A without actually doing this stuff. If, if you confidently understand that idea. I don't know. It's up to you. Like one way or the other, you need to understand how to, say, take an absolute value inequality and understand what part of the number line that, that corresponds to, right, the solution. Any questions? This always gives you guys trouble. And I say you guys as if I could generalize you with previous math classes I've taught. But people struggle with the same things, generally speaking. Like, as I, I think I told you before, 
when I, when I give a problem like this at start of Calculus 1, I've always got 30% of the students who are kind of floundering on it. Because if you don't use this stuff a lot, you lose it, right? So you may have been totally competent with it at some point in a previous course, but if you don't keep hammering away at that and using it in your daily life, these things will kind of evaporate from your mind, right? So you need to get them back stuck to your, you know, processor, so to speak. Any question about these ones in particular? I have a PDF. Remember, I, I, I posted that little extra example, pair of examples. Um, I have the PDF of that scan now. I'm going to post that in course content, hopefully after class. So you can also look at the PDF to correspond to the video that was talking about these laws real slow, just those two examples. Um, I mean, there will be, I can tell you, I mean, sometimes I can say some things about the test. Like one thing I can say about the test is there will be a problem like something here. Uh, possibly. But, I mean, they're definitely, definitely the test will involve the things in the last problem, right? There's going to be something about a number line. There's certainly going to be something about interval notation. There's certainly going to be something about solving an inequality. You know. So my strategy for doing these is just to get rid of radicals, convert everything to exponent notation, clean up the numerator, clean up the denominator, and then try to combine all the things. Those are my th the three stages of my thought process. Number one, eliminate radicals in favor of exponents. Number two, collect everything I can together in the numerator and the denominator separately. Right, like use that the the cube of the squared is the product of the cubes, you know. Then use the law of exponents, x squared cubed is x to the sixth. Right, I do all that those kind of like things to clean up this and to clean up that. Once I once I've you know done enough of that, then I, I'll I'll simplify top and bottom. I don't rigidly follow what I just said either. Right, if you look at this. I pretty much just got to the point where, okay, I've got a product of things. I don't have any like grouped things powered. And at that point, I just collect everything upstairs and downstairs according to, well, why did I put x up here and y down there? The reason for that was where I'm going. I'm trying to find something of the form x to the a, y to the b, right? So I, I kind of want the x to be upstairs and the y to be downstairs for the purpose of finding the answer. So again, this one, um, this one is, is different, right? Because I can't, I can't take care of the radical first because it's on the outside. So my previous advice isn't going to work, is it? See, so this is why I hesitate to try to give universal advice because invariably I've failed to neglect, I mean, I've neglected to, you know, look at my second example. Can I get rid of the radicals to start with? No, I mean, like that outside radical is the last thing I have to do. So... This this big one, this big one here. Okay. I didn't really though. I just I said it's there. It's the half power, but I haven't actually. You know, I leave it there. I don't try to fix it until first I've done what? Until I've simplified the inside. And then I use laws of exponents: three halves, five halves times one half is five fourths is minus. You know. Number three, like part C. Problem, uh, this one on the currently projected or number three? No, not that. Like the actual Gotcha. So, yeah, to find the domain of an expression, we just need to make sure that we exclude any x values which don't make the expression be real or worse yet, make it undefined. Like division by zero is not even a number. Square root of a negative number, well, that's complex, but we're, we're trying to keep it real in here, right? So, um, so um, for the most part, I have asked you to like factor some polynomials over the complex numbers. So there, there are places where we do a little, we dabble in the complex number system, right? But our default is to look for real solution, like real domains, right? So. 
as a, as, a, as a general rule in here, unless I say explicitly work over the complex numbers, you're just looking for just the real solutions or the real domains, okay? So. Um, so this is a polynomial, no strings attached, the whole domain is all the reals. This one, that square root of 2x plus 7, I need that 2x plus 7 to be non-negative. I need that to be non-negative. In other words, 2x plus 7 greater than or equal to 0, which we can solve to give x greater than minus 7 halves, right? But that would suggest the interval minus 7 halves to infinity. Does that make sense? No? No is okay. What, what is it? Where are we stuck? What's that? All of it. No, no, no. There, you gotta, we got to start somewhere. Like, is it is it the question is like what does we mean by domain, or why I'm doing what I'm doing? So, I'm I'm looking at this expression, right? The question to figure out the domain is what x are allowed in order to keep that square root real. So if we were to plug in like a negative number into it, we'd be in trouble because then we'd have a complex answer. We'd have an imaginary number. So we need, we need the input to the square root to be to either to be a positive number or to be 0. The square root of 0 is 0. That's fine. So that's why I set this 2x plus 7 to be greater than or equal to 0. And then how, how do we solve that inequality? How do you solve 2x plus 7 greater than or equal to 0? What do you do? I heard you. I'll, I'll start. I'll write it up here. 2x plus 7 greater than or equal to 0. All right. So you said, what did, I, what did you guys tell me? Do first? Yeah, subtract 7 to the other side, and then do what? Divide by 2. And so there, that's, that's the, you know, one way to exp explain what the domain is. On a test, if you told me that the domain was that, I'd give you at least partial credit depending on my answer, my, my instructions. If my instructions just say find the domain, I've kind of left myself open for you to give me the domain in any, which, any old which way you want. If I say find the domain and write, the, write your answer in interval notation, then this isn't done yet, right? Because you need to write it in interval notation. This is not interval notation. Interval notation um, is, <clears throat> and we can think about the number line if it helps, minus 7 halves, right? And we're going this way, right? x is to the right of minus 7 halves. And so as an interval, this is minus 7 halves to infinity. And that's why I wrote down that is the domain of the expression. I hope I did. Yeah, I did. Does that? So what, was it, was these details that were like, that was the part that was kind of like, It's fine to not know exactly where the uncertainty is coming from, you know, but we want to work enough problems so that, that that goes away, right? If my mission is not enough, I've also remember assigned you, assigned, suggested what? Recommended homework problems, right? So if you got a mission problem wrong, the right thing to do then is to go, okay, what part of the recommended homework is like that problem? I maybe should go work those to make sure that I actually understand this. Right? Don't just let me bully you into understanding my solution to that particular problem. Go seek out problems which are like it, work those as well, and if you have any questions about those, you know, you should bring them to me. Does that make sense? So be better than I was as a student. When I'm a student, a lot of times what I do when I study is I just review the part I already know because it makes me feel good. And I kind of like put off the part I don't know until like 2 a.m. on the day of the test. And then I'll be up at like 3 going, I don't understand this. i got to go to bed. Oh, well. <laughs> don't be me. <laughs> Attack the part you don't know early on in your studying so that you can rest well the day before the test, you know? Be like my wife. Play video games the day before the test to annoy your friends. That's, that is, she always try to she'll do work as she goes in the course. So when it gets to be like test day, she's got nothing to study. So she's that, that annoying person that would just go play the day before the test. That was not me, but very aggravating. Um, this one here, 
5x over x squared plus 4x plus 5. What is the possible danger here? The possible danger, at least in principle, is that that denominator function could go to 0, right? Like if this was 0, we're in trouble. How do we see whether or not a quadratic can possibly be 0? There are really two ways. You could factor it, or you could complete the square. So if you can't factor it, you better complete the square. Right? If you could factor it, and it factored to like x minus 1 times x minus 2, then you'd know that 1 and 2 are places where it could be 0. But this one doesn't factor. It, in fact, is, this is complete the square. We get x plus 2 squared plus 1. That reminds me. Another thing I can confidently say about your test, completing the square is definitely part of the test. Right? That, that is something I will, at least one place, force you to complete the square. Like, it'll be part of the instructions. Um, other places, I'll just give you a task where you could either complete the square or do it another way. I won't, I won't force the issue. Many, many places you could complete. There's a lot of problems where you could either complete the square or do factoring. And it, it's kind of like whichever works better for you. It's not a big deal. Um, I mean, you can use the quadratic equation to figure out how to answer certain questions. I'm not averse to that either. You can use that if you need to. Just make sure you use it correctly. Um, now, so notice that we have x plus 2 squared plus 1, right? So when we have something squared plus something else, there's no way that can be 0. Therefore, the domain is all real numbers because we don't have any trouble with the formula. The, the division by 0 never happens. We're good to go. That, that's how I think about this kind of problem. In contrast, this one, the next one, we can factor. X squared, you know, it's such, it's such I mean, it's very, so, so very similar, right? 4x plus 5 versus 5x plus 4, but it makes all the difference. 5x plus 4 factors to x plus 1 times x plus 4, which means if we plug in minus 1 or if we plug in minus 4 into this, what's this called? This is called a rational fun, rational expression, rather. Well, we get division by 0, which we cannot have. So we have to throw out minus 1 and minus 4 from the domain. And so in so doing, we get this as our, our answer because we have to exclude the 4 and exclude the minus 1. Questions? No? Number 10? So you guys are good on these ones? I like this one. This one's fun. No? You didn't think it was fun? You don't think this one was fun? Man. Two x plus three over two plus x. That's good. That's good. I bet you guys got these parts right, right? Um, one one thing I should mention um, before I forget, and we'll, we'll go on to your problem ten soon, but um, just a word here. Um, do you guys know the binomial theorem? So, um, can you hit the lights for a second here? It wasn't called, you call it uh, Pascal's triangle? Yeah. Right, this, this, this result is known as the binomial theorem. Um, Pascal's triangle gives coefficients for binomial theorem. So what I mean is we have a plus b to the n power. That's equal to the sum k equals 0 to n of n choose k a to the power, um, I think a to the power k, b to the power 
um, n minus k. Oh, no, a to the, ooh, sorry. Um, goodness gracious. Uh, a to the n minus k, b to the k, say. So it, it, I doubt you saw that. So what I'm saying, um, and, and you'll, you're, this is not part of the required part of the course, guys. Like, I do not expect you to know this, although um, I, that's another thing I should remind is I did say you can have a sheet of notes for the quiz and for the test, right? So you should, you know. Yeah, a sheet of paper, front and back, whatever you want. Yep, yep. Just two sides. So um, this one, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five. So like five choose zero is one. Five choose, oh, this is four. Five choose, um, good grief, four choose zero is one. Four choose, four choose one is four. Four choose two is six. Four choose three is four. And um, four choose four is one. And those have a significance to counting. Like if you want to know the number of ways you can pick two things from four things, there are six different ways. Yeah? If you pick two things from A, B, C, D, there's four things. There's six different ways you can do that. Think about it. You can go A, B, A, C, A, D. Right? Or you can do what? Um, B, C, B, D, right? And what's the, what's the sixth pair you could pick? Distinct pair. C, D, right. So that's the significance of these uh, um, binomial coefficients. They have to do with counting. But anyway, all I'm telling you guys is, is this a useful trick if you're faced with the question of like how to multiply out something with a, you know, like a big power? So suppose I have like x plus 2 to the fourth. If you know the binomial theorem, you can say, oh, okay, well, that's x to the fourth plus 4. Um, oh, excuse me, plus 4 times 2 to the 1x cubed plus 6 um, times 2 squared x squared plus 4 times 2 to the cubed times x to the 1 and then plus, well, 2 to the power 4. So x plus 2 to the 4th power is in fact x to, x to the 4th plus 8x cubed, plus 24x squared, plus 32x, plus 16. I assure you that that is faster than just multiplying it out. And this becomes even more true if you look at higher powers. So this is Pascal's triangle in the binomial theorem. You can get the coefficients for just unwrapping the thing. So I, I'm just using that. I'm, I'm pointing out here. If I do 2x plus 1 um, cubed, I can look at it as like 2x plus 1 cubed plus 3 times 2x plus 1 squared times 1 plus 3 times 2x 1 times 1 squared plus 1 times um, 1 cubed. And that, that's using these coefficients in the Pascal's triangle. Right. Or you're like, um, well, I don't know that, or I wasn't taught it before, I'm not comfortable with it. Fine, you can ignore me and just um, multiply out the cube. I mean, that's also possible, right? Just be careful when you do it, that's all. I hope you guys won't be too annoyed with me. I, my children get really annoyed with me when, 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 I'm, when I'm asked a mathematical question and then I give them more than one possible answer to the question, they get very annoyed. I hope you won't be annoyed. I'm trying to share with you sometimes more than one way to do something. Um, 
I pretty much will always tell you when there's one way you have to know. Like I just told you, completing the square, you, you need to know how to do that, right? Now, you asked me to do number 10 like three minutes ago. You're like, it was five minutes ago. Sorry about that. Here's number 10. Number 10 actually is kind of a, a beastly thing. So, um, I um, had <laughs> 17. You know what? Let's let's replace. I mean, this is fine. What I'm trying to say is, this is difficult. Yeah. This is a kind of difficult problem in terms of the arithmetic of the problem. Um, a way for me to make this problem similar but easier <laughs> is. So let me, let me, let me show you a, uh, an example which is kind of like this in spirit, but in truth it's a little bit easier. Aw oh, man, this board, it has not long to live. I think I'm going to have to get a new one. It's going to cost me like ten whole dollars at Home Depot, you know? Maybe 15. What I do is I get the 8 foot by 4 foot like white bathroom paneling and I'll set, have them rip it down the middle. That's all this stuff is. So, Or who knows? Maybe they'll, um, maybe they'll assemble that. I don't know. I mean that is, that is a, it's a portable whiteboard right there. It is in that box. And I'm told that there are also a pair of portable chalkboards on order who knows, maybe they'll appear and they'll be nice. We'll, we'll find out. But until, what's that? How tall are you? Taller than me? Probably. See, because for me, for, I mean, I feel like this is a, a height discrimination lawsuit waiting to happen. This, here, let me, let me exaggerate it a little bit. <laughs> no, like, that's as tall as I can write <laughs> without like jumping. <laughs> Get a chair. <laughs> the thing is, I understand that these boards used to be lower. A particular professor, I think, had them like installed this. And then, uh, but the thing is, that professor is taller. <laughs> and so if you're like six foot two, sure, this is, this is okay. But. You're six foot two, yeah. But we, we have a number of female faculty here who are shorter than me. So this, <laughs> and this room used to be turned the other way, I guess, before my time. But now with the COVID, we got to space you guys out, right? It's always been like this? Really? Oh. So I must have heard a story from like years past or something. I guess it was whatever they put in this. And I don't know. All right, so I was going to make up an example that was like this, but easier. We could have something like 3 plus i divided by, you know, 2 plus um, 6i squared. And I could say, you know, same instructions, like rewrite this complex number so that it's in its Cartesian form, in the form a plus bi, and find a and b. So the, re the reason this problem is a little bit easier is because I don't have two things multiplied in the numerator to start with. And I think I made the numbers smaller, so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic this is going to be easier. So first order of business is multiply out the denominator, which gives me 4 plus um, 20, uh, 24i. Um, plus 36 i squared. I regret putting that 6 there now. Um, oh well, too late. So i squared is minus 1, right? So that we can write as 3 plus i over minus 32 plus 24 i. 